joining us for this uh, conversation on data. Uh, and I suppose at the times like this, the thinking about marketing one's school when we're facing the unpredictable outturn of a, of a pandemic and the end of the furlough, it's, uh, it's a crucial time to be thinking about marketing and making sure that anything that we're investing our time and money in is as effective as possible. So I think we'll start with a situation where you've been planning a marketing push. What are you going to do? Who are you going to market to? Uh, I, I truly believe that you need to know where you are now and where you want to be um, before you even start um, with a marketing plan and the strategies behind it. Finding out where you are now is the basis of research, um, where you're positioned in the marketplace, um, where you're currently getting your customers from, how your inquiries um, are mapped out. And um, where you want to be is really how you sit amongst your, your competitors and whether, whether you're a school that's going to take some market share. So even before you start thinking about marketing, I think those two things are, are crucial. Well, we had a, a chat about this yesterday, didn't we, Gemma? Yeah, and we really, what Sophie was just saying is um, totally accurate. It's understanding who your families are, you know, understanding the people who are coming to you and then making sure that you are... Um, targeting the right audience not just geographically um, but you know in, in terms of you know how affordable you are and the kinds of families that you're attracting so it's really tuning in to you know who you already have in your community and also over time historically think about how that changes um, so that you can start to plan for, for your audience that's out there but we did identify several challenges didn't we Gemma um not specific yeah. to COVID but but certainly not helped by that um in terms of reaching so identifying who our target audience is I don't think is the challenge I think it's reaching them for us that's the biggest challenge several different ways of doing this I think for, for Tracy and I we often see trends in who is coming through the door at St John's so for that way we kind of try and tailor the marketing around that. Just picking up on something you said Sophie about um, knowing where you are and where your inquiries are coming from what ways do you find are the, are the best ways for schools to to actually get that data out of their, their current parents? I mean I think a little bit of navel gazing to start with on, on um, you know how, how you think your your processes and uh, your systems are working um, but um, I'm a great advocate for regular surveying of parents um, and pupils and staff and non-joiners all that data informs and once you've done it once it's a great benchmark for the next time I mean I don't say every year do those things because it becomes too costly but I would say I do a non-joiner every two years uh, a perception survey every two to three years and I do an ongoing um, kind of satisfaction and general perception amongst, within the school itself um, every other year as well. Um, I think benchmarking is really, really important because with, without that, you can't track your progress. Not a risk there, just playing a devil's advocate that it will tell you things you already know. It might tell you things you already know, but in my experience in my last school, um, we, we found some very surprising results to some of those things. I, I can give an example. Um, and you mentioned earlier that the school went through a lot of change and we were finding it very difficult to position ourselves uniquely in the marketplace. And the thing that we were shying away from most of all was the naval heritage of the school. We felt it was turning people off but actually our, our, our research work came back with very def different de data. It came back with data that said it was the one thing that everybody really loved about the school. So it was a, there was a risk we were going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Um, so the challenge then was how do we use that so that it resonates with people that are not within the school, that are not, who don't know us well? How do we communicate the good things about that naval heritage rather than it being the scary thing that we thought was putting everybody off and and I believe that we did a quite a good job of that and um and got the message out there that there were advantages to that heritage not least the fact is it's something different but it also had a true educational value and how did you do that Sophie if you don't mind me asking what 
Um, we we went through um, we went through a complete brand repositioning, to be honest. And um, once we realised that this is the one thing that everybody said they never wanted to change, um, it was the one thing that made them proud of the school. And that when we're talking about all stakeholders here, we're talking about parents, pupils, staff old boys etc the ones that we had to change are the prospective parents who were non-joiners or were on the on the fence and feeder schools um and that's where our challenge was so it was an awful lot of focus groups being brainstorming to get to a point where we put down everything that was true about the school and formulated really a positioning statement a set of words that everybody agreed that, that was true and we felt resonated with those other those, those other groups and then we tested it um, and then we used that as the basis of a, of a complete rebrand and as you know Gemma you know the danger is everyone feels a rebrand is literally a new logo and a new website mm -hmm. or a new prospectus it's not yeah. it's what people yeah. say about you when you're not in the room so yeah. actually having that set out in stone um was 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 you know what we hung everything else on that's that's really useful and um back when uh, when i was ahead and we were rebranding the the staff hated the name of the school and thought that it gave people completely the wrong message and that was sort of the number one thing that they wanted to change and thankfully we did go out to the parents because they came back overwhelmingly in support of the name and said that it was what one of the things that attracted them to the school so uh so the name didn't end up changing much. Um, it just got the name of the city appended to it so it would uh, uh, appear higher in the Google search. Uh. Tracy and Gemma, have either of you had any um, done any market research where you've been surprised at the results? We've always been very, I guess, confident in where we're positioned within the marketplace around the Banbridgeshire area. Um, so for us, yeah, we've always been kind of confident with our approach particularly now we've just launched a brand new website and for us um, you know we're traditional with values-based learning so we've kind of implemented that across our website and the branding across our social media so it's kind of simple traditional but it's something that everyone can resonate with so yeah I guess we're, we've got that confidence knowing that that's what the school stands for and where we're targeting and how we're targeting. But you know what I think is a challenge is um, I completely understand what Sophie's saying and we do parent surveys, we've done pupil surveys, we do talk to non-joiners but actually mm. the people who you really need to get the information from are, are the people who, who just don't come to you and of course you can't mm. because they don't come to you you know th those are the ones what you've been talking about about perception it's the perception that stops people from coming to you and that's really what you need to know and that's quite hard isn't it to tap into I mean we are very aware of our limitations so we're in the town centre we've got limitations on our site and we've mm. worked really hard to overcome those limitations and also to make sure that we're marketing, you know, what we are doing, because then we feel that if people's perception is, oh, well, they haven't got a lot of grounds in our marketing, we're sharing the sites that we do use and we have really good facilities that we can use. But, our, but there's definitely a challenge in, you know, really the most valuable information would come from people who don't come yeah. to us, yeah. go to the website and they never pick up the phone or... Why don't they? That's really what we need to know, isn't it? I agree, Tracy. I mean, I I, I did do quite a lot of non-joiner research, and I think probably because we had the numbers, um, you know, we're talking sort of 1,500 inquiries per year, and I'm not sure what sort of level you 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 get, but um, the, out of that, you get a good proportion who are prepared to say exactly why they didn't join. And actually... One one year, quite a long time ago, it was instrumental in making a, a making a complete change to the structure of our house system. So um, this this was some um, information that came back that said that they felt that joining at eleven um, was a bit too scary. This obviously a senior big boarding school um, like that joining at 11 into a house where it goes all the way up to sixth form might deem a little bit scary particularly if you've come from a small primary school so that that um, informed us that we needed to do something slightly different so it led to a restructure so all year sevens went into basically a starting out house 
Mm. So they had that lovely year of, of being treated like prep school children still and having that transition period where they, they kind of got to grips with how everything worked so they could move into their senior house later. So whilst that wasn't a marketing as in promotional um, solution, it was a product solution. So as far as I was concerned, you know, we were changing our product to suit the market that was saying to us, uh -uh, no, this is too much, too big. And, and, it's, and it worked. From a marketing point of view, we produced a little film about starting out. We did, you know, specifically about that house. We produced a specific starting out prospectus and we tailored our communications accordingly. And, and it worked. So that, that's kind of an example of where we listened to the non-joiners and did something that wasn't going to upset the rest of the school and those further up, but it did um, help with our marketing and recruitment. I wonder about taking things a step step back before then as well. So, so not, not just the non-joiners, but the people who could be able to afford independent school, but aren't even getting in touch. So why aren't they coming to to do visits and open days. One of the things we did was we got our staff to go and talk to all of their friends. And they were as surprised as we were to find that a number of their friends thought that some, for some strange reason, they wouldn't be eligible for independent school, that they weren't sort of posh enough. And they had a, a strange perception of independent school as being only for a, a certain sector of, of the country. And when actually the teachers said, nope, most of our parents are uh, very similar to you and me. They were pleasantly surprised. That was mm. that was a quite interesting piece of uh, very informal research. That's interesting. Mm. My children used to be at a little prep school in Suffolk, and I was amazed the numbers of families who joined us in year one, so not reception, but in year one, who were far more affluent than we were, but they thought the primary sector would be fine. And it wasn't until they joined with their... Their, their first child they got through the first year and realized that it wasn't it hadn't met their requirements that they started to have a look around for alternatives and that was when they joined us at old school Hensted. it was then but they were families far more affluent than us and our research has shown there's around a million and a half children living in families who could in theory afford an independent school who match the credentials of independent school buyers but for whatever reason they choose not to send their children we ran a report we called the missing million we've since up, updated it which is how we know it's now a million and a half um <laughs> that was looking at how many families are just ethically uh, against the concept of paying for an education um in many cases it was families who didn't think they could afford it uh, many would have to make some form of a sacrifice, be that on a, um, on a, a new car every year or maybe not having the most amazing holidays every single year. But there is a certain type of family who match that profile. Once we know who that um, those families are, then we can locate those in, in a catchment area relatively easily. Have you ever had any data or research which has caused you to sort of challenge maybe uh, your senior leadership's uh, perception or the governor's perception on what you should be doing? Um, yeah, while I was at the um, Royal Hospital School, um, we were changing from a full boarding school to taking day pupils as well. And naturally, that was an organic growth um, from sort of within 10 minutes of the school, those who'd actually seen and heard about it, and, and gradually a, a, a sort of organic growth away from that. Um, some work that we commissioned um, uh, gave us some insight into town planning around the Colchester area um, and down the A12 towards London. And um, it, it convinced me that actually we needed to be focusing on that area. And whilst we could market uh, to those, those people um, digitally and, and um, in more traditional ways, the most effective form of marketing is to ensure that we're giving a product that people will buy. And that is often when it's a day pupil, um, the transport to get to the school. I had to sort of go into battle with my SMT to say that I was convinced that that's where we should start to grow our roots. And we started with very small people carriers traveling down there, um, growing to a, a, a minibus and, and eventually to a double decker 
uh, to two buses picking up along along the A12 and, and bringing into school within about five years. So it, it takes some time and it takes you know some 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 data behind it to to convince people it's the right investment to make. But it, I, I believe it is. Um, it is is probably the strongest form of marketing is ensuring you've got a product that people will buy into and getting to school is one of the number one reasons for choosing a day school and that's also often one of the main reasons families use a, a primary school over, over a prep school in that a primary school is often just around the corner or, or just on the same street they can walk there whereas if they're using an independent school in many cases they have to travel well how do we work that in with two working parents in order to afford the fees in the first instance mm. again there's this the school bus option adds in both ways in that it adds convenience for parents and that they don't have to make the journey but it also adds childcare on the end of the day where this the school is then accommodating the child from the moment they, they they start to use the bus until the moment they get home in the evening I have an example of where price um, became a, a sticking point. Um, this was uh, a result of some analysis over competitor fees. When dipping into a new marketplace, you are kind of want to undercut, therefore take market share quite quickly. And I discovered through research that we were getting it very, very wrong. And it's not often that you try and convince your bursar to put up the fees, but I did. Whilst uh, it wasn't a carte blanche up with the fees, um, it was all about segmentation and just taking some time to really look at your audiences and who actually would pay more for what you're offering and who couldn't and wouldn't. So was, we, what we, we tried to do is package what was a day fee and what you got to what was a day boarding come kind of all including included package. So you maybe wanted to be at school till nine o'clock and having done your prep, et cetera, et cetera. That's a different price. Then there was a three night boarding for those who are at the extremes of the catchment and didn't want to travel every day, but didn't want to board full time. So we started getting into the realms of being really clever about the product and the price and just not following the crowd, but actually undercutting and making enough money all the way across um, so that the books would balance at the end of the day. Actually, in our nursery, we offer kind of extracurricular provision for, for families that are paying only in kind of afternoon sessions. So it's a good way for us to get people paying for nursery sessions because that can be a challenge with the government funding. That's kind of how we use it at St John's. We have found in our research is that the schools that have grown the most are actually those with the highest fees which, if anything, just encourages fee rises because they, everybody's trying to keep up with the Joneses. There's certainly evidence of it being a bevel and good. So parents, if they are paying a lot for it, well, it must be better. And certainly in the international boarding market, the more expensive your fees are, the more attractive you are to international boarders because those families then have bragging rights and they feel as though they're, they are buying something far superior because it's far more expensive than anybody else's. In reality, it means we are losing a lot of our traditional core market who simply can't afford the fees. We've ended up in a, a race for facilities to try and keep up with the, the schools who have made large surpluses and therefore have built a large sports halls that our school then has to have a large sports hall to compete. Um, that then all becomes a slippery slope to the point where you see new lower priced offerings starting to crop up here and there there's one in newcastle isn't there that's 52 pounds a week those types of offerings attempting to try something new try and break that that growth one of the important pieces of research that that we did when i was ahead was uh, to look at where our um, open day attendees and our uh, visitors to the school were coming from and we discovered that 80% were coming because of a referral from a current parent. So one of our big marketing pushes was actually to invest not so much in advertising and external things, but in internal events to make our current parents feel valued and specifically events that they could invite their friends uh, along to. I think there's been some incredibly inventive and, and, and intuitive ideas out there that have, um, have put, you know, I put independent schools on the map as, as doing it so well. 
And that really backs up what um, Peter's saying, doesn't it? Although I acknowledged it as a challenge, if our families are, if we're reaching them via our social media platforms and they're sharing our posts, then just by default, we're reaching their friends. And there's, I mean, that that in itself, using platforms like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, et cetera, you know, that in itself is producing data that for marketing purposes is going to be valuable in the future. I mean, that engagement um, now will actually benefit us later on in terms of, of getting out to more families. Those consumer audiences that we can create from that data will allow us to go to lookalike audiences further afield and target accordingly. So again, that's an example of how data now and technology now will inform our marketing going forward. I wonder if you've got any stories of where um, data has maybe been misunderstood or only properly understood after an event. One of the challenges here is there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. It's <laughs> <laughs> framed in how we ask the question in the first instance. Yeah. But then also the angle we look at the data from. One of the, the things we've found is that lots of parents like their school because it's nice and comfortable. It's a comfortable place to be. But at what point does comfortable turn into complacent? And actually, yeah. there isn't much of a drive forwards. I totally agree with you there, James. As you say, the question influences the way you read the data. And I think getting an objective view from someone outside of your organisation is is it's the only way to go because um, I think it's too subjective if you do it as an internal project. Has anyone got any really sort of constructive and, um, and imaginative examples of uh, use of data? I did some work on affordability and family profiling um, some time ago, which uncovered the fact that we were possibly giving away money without actually needing to. So scholarships were being used as a bribe, perhaps, rather than a true reflection of talent. So this research informed us to shake that up. It made our bursary and scholarship policy and procedures a much fairer process. The first thing that we found is it was possibly unfair to deem a 11 year old a scholar. So uh, we turned those into um, awards and those awards were basically in, in name only and they were recognition of the fact that they had talent and they would be considered for a scholarship later on. A scholarship did not necessarily become with a, with a, with a pound sign, but what it did do is, is, is open up a means testing, testing process that um, any parent w with a child with a scholarship was able to access if they were willing to, to give information about their personal circumstances. It saved the school a lot of money. It did not turn off potential um, families. Um, they were being recognised for talent, celebrated for potential, yet we weren't using money to, um, to entice them to come, which tends to go yeah, lead to a sort of slippery slope of, of reducing average fee income across the board. We know 800 variables on every single household in the UK. So we know all about everybody. And if we're looking for any specific data, it's all there. You just need to know where to look. Terrifying, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's big data. That's big data. <laughs> but for me, I think data is just so important in setting goals and um, and and KPIs. I think measuring and tracking is just so important for all of us. We we haven't got the budgets to 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 waste. And we certainly haven't got the time to steer from our plans. So having those clear objectives in place and, and KPIs are, are just crucial. And I go back to what I said about benchmarking and, and, and tracking where we, where, where, we, where, we, where we are now and where we want to go and how we're going to get there. And whenever you spend money on, on, um, on data, I feel that, you know, you've got your data, but also don't just put it on a shelf and let it get dusty. Um, that data comes with insight and that insight needs to be analysed. It needs to be shared. And an action plan needs to be um, created out of it. 
where everyone's involved, not just you, Gemma, and, and uh, mm. you know, the, the, the marketing team or, mm. or even the senior management team. It needs to be shared with everyone. There is yeah. a danger that you spend you know, a considerable amount of money on, on, on creating data, but there's nothing worse than leaving it on the shelf and letting it gather dust. One of the things that we find is that often the, the value in the data is as much in the conversation that it generates within the team than as, as the data itself. So in a, a presentation of findings, much of my role is to encourage the conversation, encourage the discussion around why that might be, what can we do about it, as opposed to just being, well, here's, here's where we are missing in the catchment. Oh, okay. What does that mean? How do we do something about that? Is there a reason? Could there be a reason that is not in the data, but would be in the room? As sort of the marketing departments, how much responsibility do you feel for the school's future? Huge amount. <laughs> if we don't get pupils through the door, then there will be no school. So yeah, we do take it really seriously. And I'm, I really feel passionate about my school that I work for and, you know, trying to get families in for the longevity, not just people that will be with us for a couple of years and jump ship, but are in it from the long run. So particularly from my point of view with the marketing of St. John's, um, we do a lot of targeting from the nursery so that the families join at that level and will maintain and stay right through until the end. Still a big responsibility. I agree. Um, you know, I, I, I think marketing is not just about generating inquiries and, and leave everybody else uh, to do the rest of the job. Customer relationship management is, is, is key. Um, and that's therefore, you know, a very tight working relationship with your admissions team, a very tight re working relationship with the academic team and, and so forth. It, it's a loyalty loop. You have, you know, you, you get your customers in and they're going to be your advocates for the future. Mm. It's our responsibility as marketeers to have sight of that entire customer journey um, because if they they're unhappy at the end they're not gonna they're not gonna give positive word of mouth it's it, it, it the, the loyalty loop continues and it, it makes life easier and and marketing less expensive if you keep that going um, mm. so it's the whole journey and therefore it is on our shoulders um, very much on our shoulders because mm. we're the ones you know should be you know involved in every stage Thank you for joining us. I hope you have found this an interesting and informative session. If there are any t topics you would like us to discuss in future, then please do get in touch. And thank you to all the panelists for joining me and we hope to, hope to see you all again somewhere soon. Bye.